Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. We have a, a topic today that uh, you and I have discussed a lot, and you've talked about this in group, um, and it's uh, about uh, using uh, antidepressants as an adjunct to therapy. Um, but uh, there's been uh, some controversy about this uh, recently. You've written, co-written an article. Uh, what was the title of the article that uh, you, you Well, the co-wrote? article that I co-authored was uh, Antonuccio, Burns, and Danton, and it was entitled Antidepressants, colon, a, a Triumph of Marketing Over Science, yeah. question mark. And right. that was in the journal Prevention and Treatment. It came out a good 10 years ago, uh, and I'll put the reference... Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. On the show notes there, but that was one of the most downloaded articles, you know, from uh, mental health field, research articles you know, in a decade. Yeah, that was a very, yeah. very popular article. And then... And that referred to, uh, to a book also. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, right. The, uh, the, the Emperor's New Drugs, is that Yeah, right? Irving Kirsch, who, who was a researcher at Harvard, and he, he has something called the uh, Center for the Study of the Placebo Response, or some such yeah. uh, research institution, institute at Harvard... Uh, wrote a book. He, he's written some articles uh, and, and research journals on antidepressants, and then he wrote a book that you can get on Amazon. It's a it's a short uh, book. It's inexpensive. It's a small paperback. It's called uh, "The Emperor's New Drugs: Exploding yeah. the Antidepressant Myth." Yeah, and I get a lot of questions on on, on these uh, on these topics, so I thought it might be a good a good topic for for our, for our listeners. It, it's it's a very controversial. When I present this in my workshops, I present it as an optional luncheon lecture called "Controversies in Biological uh, Psychiatry." But people get pretty interested and, and pretty fired up. They do, let, yeah. Let me say that the the information I I share in this podcast, I, I won't be saying here's the gospel truth, the answer one way or the other on, on these things. I'll be giving you and the listeners my reading of the literature based yeah. on my, my research background and my research training, but I can't say that my way to look at the thing is, is the only correct way to look at it because people are very fired up and arguing intensely on both both sides of this of this argument, so I'm, I'm really just trying to share some uh, interesting and, and, and fairly shocking shocking information. Um, before we start out, let, let me say that both uh, research on depression and on antidepressants and research on psychotherapy as well is confounded and difficult to interpret because of something called the, the, the placebo effect. And what the placebo cool. effect... Which, by the way, is present in, in most medical studies. It doesn't have to be just uh, uh, mental health. A- a- absolutely. Uh, in fact... Uh, The placebo effect means that for something to be a valid technique in in medicine, it has to outperform placebo to a clinically significant degree. And maybe we can tell people who don't know what a placebo is. Yeah, well, a placebo could could be anything. Like I saw one on TV, there was some controversial surgery for, for knee problems, yeah. and they, they divided the, the people into two groups. The, they both were going to receive surgical procedures, yeah. but one group received the actual surgical procedure, and the other, was they just cut in and then sewed the people back up. They didn't actually go into the joint and do this yeah. surgical, surgical procedure. I think it was on 60 Minutes or one of the top... TV documentary programs, and the, the odd thing was that there was no difference in outcomes in the two groups, and quite a large percentage of people in both groups just swore that this operation helped them tremendously. They yeah. showed a fellow who couldn't even walk, 
And after the operation, he was, you know, running and hiking and, okay. you know, doing tremendous yeah. things. And he was actually in the placebo group. He didn't yeah. get the actual yeah. surgery. And the placebo effect just means that if you really believe that something's going to help you, uh, uh, there's a good chance it will, even if it's a, an inert chemical. And so when they test antidepressants, they, they would take a, a group of people, uh, say 60 patients with moderate to severe depression and, and, and put them into two groups. Yeah. And they would say that half of you are going to get, uh, you know, this placebo, which is just a pill with powder in it that, yeah. that has no chemical effect yeah. versus my new antidepressant, which might be Prozac or, or, or whatever it happens to be. And then they, they test the two groups for something like oh, 12 to 15 weeks and then they see if there's any difference in, in the effectiveness yeah. in, in those in those two groups. Right. And um, so um, Irving Kirsch uh, was wanted to learn more about you know placebo effects. So he went. Which, if we could harness the power of the placebo effect, would be quite useful too. Oh yes, and it can be you know kind of kind of misleading. Let me, let me give you another example. I, I, I give in, in workshops just to. So the listeners will, will understand this. Let's say I, I, I well, let's say I have a, a press conference to announce uh, uh, a fantastic new antidepressant my drug company has synthesized, mm -hmm. and I announce that it's probably the most powerful antidepressant ever developed, and it's the safest one ever de developed. It has almost almost no side effects, and it's safe in overdose that you 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 can't kill yourself by overdosing on this yeah. medicine. And to prove its effectiveness... So you can get fat. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but to prove its effectiveness, I'm going to give it to uh, a million Americans who are depressed yeah. for free in, in the largest study of depression in human yeah. history. And, oh, by the way, the name of my new drug is called placebo. Mm -hmm. And it's actually... Uh, but I don't tell people this. It's actually a placebo. Right. It has no... no active ingredients. And so we give it to a million Americans. And what will happen in three to five weeks? What percentage of those severely depressed million Americans will be cured from a placebo in, in three some, or four weeks? Some percentage will. Yeah. The the number, it's it's between 35 and 45 percent of those people. Their depression will entirely disappear. Yeah. And they'll say, this drug cured me. And they'll go on talk shows on television and say this is the most, you know, the best thing since French fries, and yeah. everyone should be who's depressed should be taking this pill. But but yet it's it's it, it really isn't an antidepressant. It just it, we we've really simply fooled a lot of a right. lot of people. So the question is is are the chemicals called antidepressants significantly more effective? Than, than placebos, because we've all... That, that's what the studies claim. That's what the studies claim, and then we've all been assuming that, and as a, starting out as a research psychiatrist, this is what I was taught, and, and I've mentioned in a previous podcast that when I was in clinical practice, I gave out prescriptions for antidepressants on more than 13,000 occasions. Yeah. Most of my patients I treated without any medications, but if a patient asked for an antidepressant, I prescribed one yeah. because I didn't want to have a malpractice suit or somebody claiming I did improper treatment. Yeah. So we all all believe that the antidepressants are real. Well, what Irving Kirsch did is he's a clinical psychologist, a research psychologist. He has no ties to drug companies. He has no bias uh, in terms of you know, trying to support this or another antidepressant. Yeah. And he, he used the Freedom of Information Act to go into the the database of the Food and Drug Administration uh, so that he could independently reanalyze all, all of the studies that uh, drug companies have, have done when they submit data trying to get some chemical approved as an antidepressant. Yeah. Because if they can get an, a new chemical called an antidepressant, show some statistically significant difference between yeah. the, pl the placebo group and the drug group, then they are allowed to call it an antidepressant, and they can market it as, at, at, market it as an antidepressant, and their yeah. stock will go up sometimes by a billion dollars within yeah. 24 hours. I wonder if you want to say something about what we mean by statistically significant 
Yeah, well, uh, right. Um, the, 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 their stock will go up by a billion dollars uh, uh, in 24 hours. Yeah. The president of the company may be getting a bonus based on some percentage of that change. And so the executives of, of the drug companies put tremendous pressure to, to, to get some report to the Food and Drug Administration that will look like there's a statistically significant difference between the placebo group and the, yeah. uh, and the antidepressant group. Statistical uh, differences are not the same as clinical differences. If, if, you, if you have a, let's say you have a tiny little difference b- between a treatment and, yeah. and a placebo, and that the difference is real, but it's just like, let, let's say, if something's to prolong the life of, of a cancer patient, yeah. Yeah. And, and the placebo group, you know, the, lives for 18 months, and, and the chemical group lives for 18 months and one day, yeah. and you have enough people in the study, that could achieve statistical significance, yeah. but it might not be clinical uh, significance, right. especially if the drug causes bad side, side effects, effects yeah, and, yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what does the data on antidepressants sh- show? Well, Irving Kirsch discovered that I think he, he analyzed data on a, a roughly 18 or 20,000 individuals with moderate to severe depression who have been treated with placebo versus every known antidepressant at every known do- dose. And he said, is there a difference? And, and he found there were about 20,000 patients in published studies and thousands of patients in repressed studies. Hmm. Uh, so looking first at the published studies, these are the ones that the drug companies wanted people to know about. Yeah. So they allowed them to be published. The patients uh, in these groups, they use something called the Hamilton Depression scale, Rating Scale for depression. The higher the score, the more the depression. And typically, they'll have an average of 25 in these studies, okay. I think that test goes to fifty or seventy or something. But a twenty-five is a you know moderate moderate depression, yeah. and to recover, we'd want that score to go from twenty-five to zero. He discovered that patients who get placebos get an eight and a half point reduction on average. Mm-hmm. That's let's say the eight thousand patients who who happen to be in the placebo group, eight and a half point reduction. These are the published studies, and the patients in the antidepressant groups got an average of 10-point reduction. Okay, so a point and a half of difference. Yes, and what he argued is three things, concluding from that. Number one, you shouldn't treat depressed patients with antidepressants or placebos because they're both rather ineffective. You need a 25-point drop. You're only getting an 8.5 to 10-point drop after 12 to 16 weeks. Although some people may say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll take whatever I can get. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and if that one and a half point difference, difference was real, that yeah. it might or might not be worth something. I, yeah. I, I have a, uh, use 50 techniques that I train my students in, in, in treating depression. Yeah. And we're generally looking for like a 50%, 25 to 50% reduction in an hour. Yeah, not one and a half point. Maybe a you know, like a three percent or five percent reduction yeah. in sixteen weeks. So I would tell my students if you have something causes a one and a half point improvement, that's not going to make my top fifty list. It's not going to make my top thousand list. The second point that Kirsch made was that this is proof that eighty five percent of what we call an antidepressant effect is a placebo effect. Because if the patients who got like the Prozac or the effects or the SSRIs and got their 10-point improvement in 12 to 16 weeks had been given the placebo, they would have had an 8.5-point improvement. And so 85% of that effect is just a placebo effect. Right. Yeah. And he and some others have argued that that's kind of unfair to patients because they believe whatever the improvement they got was due to the drug, yeah. and it really wasn't. It was due to their own coping, the, the fact that they, they had greater hope, and, and yeah. so forth. The third point that he made 
is the one that you just made, that the most we could attribute to the antidepressant is one and a half points out of 25 yeah. points, which is, 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 is meager. In the published studies. Yeah, yeah, and that's in the published studies, and that might achieve statistical significance, but it's not clinically significant. Yeah, is it, yeah it's not worth it. No, mm -hmm. it's just a tiny, a tiny effect. But then he showed that there are also thousands of patients in studies with the same drugs and placebos where there was no difference. There's just an eight and a half point difference in both the antidepressant group and the placebo group. Yeah. The drug companies have been permitted to suppress those studies. Uh, if they were mixed with the other studies, that one and a half point difference would be diluted down yeah. to like maybe a three quarters of a, almost nothing. Almost yeah. almost nothing. Yeah. Um, and and so. But these studies, they're allowed to suppress. The public never gets access to them. So in all the published studies, it says, oh, it was better than placebo. It was more significant than placebo. But they don't talk about the size of that, that, mm -hmm. that, that effect. Uh, and it makes it look like these are, are really you know, wonderful drugs when he's arguing that they have little or no meaningful antidepressant effects. Now... There's other studies uh, that are even worse than, than that because these are all drug company studies. Now, sometimes you have independent agencies that do this, this right. type of research. Yes. Of course, that makes a difference. Yeah, right. absolutely. And the federal government, the National Institute of Mental Health, did a, a study of 450 patients with carefully diagnosed major depressive disorder at six universities, and they compared... Uh, one of the antidepressants, one of the SSRI antidepressants with the placebo group and a group getting St. John's wort. And they yeah. said, how many in the two group, in the three groups, achieve improvement in 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever, whatever the study was? And their criteria for improvement were very modest. I think something like a 50% reduction in symptoms of depression, which from my way of thinking, is very poor. It's, it's, it's not impressive, and, and that's all that they were requiring to say the patients had improved. Well, in that study, the most improved group were the patients who got a placebo. I think something like 33% of them achieved the criteria for improvement, which mm -hmm. is similar to the number I mentioned at the start yeah. of the podcast. The group that got St. John's work, which was a health food supplement, and the group that got the SSRI antidepressant were like 24 or 25% of them achieved the criteria for improvement. And so in that study... I wonder why there was a difference like this. Uh, I don't know if that difference achieved statistical oh, significance okay. or not. Okay. I'd have to go back and check that yeah. out. But the, the point was that there was no difference between yeah. St. John's Ward and the SSRI antidepressant. Yeah. They weren't even as good as the, as the placebo. Yeah. Um, so the data for antidepressants doing something that, that a placebo can't do is, is uh, according to Kirsch and a number of other investigators, very very questionable. And in uh, some countries like England, they're starting to make these drugs illegal to prescribe uh, to, to, to certain groups. Like the data is very strong in teenagers and children that these drugs are, have few or no antidepressant properties. And so one by one, they've been uh, declared illegal in, in England. I don't know what the situation is now. The last time I checked was a couple of years ago, but I think the only one that was still legal for adolescents was was Prozac, and all the others had been, uh, you can't prescribe it. Now, the situation is even worse than what I've said, because other investigators, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, I'll put it on the, I'll put another reference with, with the podcast, uh, David, uh, somebody, I can remember his name, but he went into the Freedom of Information Act, uh, used that Freedom of Information Act to get all the data in the Food and Drug Administration and asked a different question. And he asked the question, if, if you give a depressed patient a placebo and you tell them it's an antidepressant, yeah. and that, how many, what is the likelihood that that patient will commit suicide during this study or become dangerously suicidal? And the answer to that was one half of one percent. One patient out of two hundred in these uh, drug studies who gets placebo will either commit suicide 
or become very actively suicidal at some point during the study. And so you think, well, gosh, we don't want to give placebos to people with depression or they'll commit suicide, a lot of them. Yeah. And then the question is, suppose they got antidepressants. Uh, then what does that do to the likelihood of, of becoming suicidal or committing suicide? And uh, in one of the, the studies, he compared uh, the placebo groups to those who got all the new costly antidepressants, effects or the SSRIs, all, all the newer antidepressants, and the answer there was that one and a half percentage of those patients became actively suicidal or committed suicide. And, and that was like this statistically significant. Oh yes, it's massive, and it's it's widely accepted now yeah. that the uh, an, the chemicals called antidepressants cause a doubling to triple or to tripling of the likelihood of a patient uh, right. committing uh, suicide. And so, these investigators have argued that because the drugs have few or no meaningful antidepressant effects, when you look at all the data, yeah. and because they cause people uh, to, to become more suicidal, uh, they should not be prescribed for people with depression. And yes. others have said yeah. that since they have no other valid applications, they shouldn't be prescribed probably for anything. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's the basic story. The, 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 the truth, though, is even more severe than that because uh, Antonuccio and Danton and I were asked by this journal Prevention and Treatment to review uh, Kirsch's studies and say, you know, just from a scientific point of view and, and say, did Kirsch, is this a valid study that, uh, that, these, that he's done, that these people are doing? Are these true findings, or is there some bias going on? Could, could this really be the case? Yeah. And we concluded in our article that they were well done, pr properly done scientific studies, and yeah. we also pointed about eight flaws in the strategies that drug companies use to test antidepressant strategies, which appear designed to, to make it look like it's favoring these chemicals over the placebos, errors in, in the research strategies. For, for example, one would have been, one would be the giving them the uh, opportunity to suppress findings that don't come out right, so, so to speak. Another flaw is the use of uh, inactive placebos. Another is called the placebo washout period. Uh, another is the don't ask, don't tell policy of side effect reporting. Another is the use of ordinary least squares rather than structural equation modeling techniques to analyze longitudinal data where you have differential dropouts uh, rates between the active group and, and the placebo group. So different methodological uh, flaws. issues. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but the drug company, and these are all easy to correct these these flaws. But the drug companies don't don't seem to to want to do that be, because their goal is marketing, and, and they've got a good thing yeah. going. And, and and so, in conclusion, um, I, I, I would say if listeners are, are interested, I'm not telling anyone stop your antidepressants or do this or, or do that. I'm just saying. From my reading of literature, and I'll, I'll probably get a lot of angry responses to this, but just doing my scientific best, uh, I, I don't see uh, convincing evidence that the chemicals called antidepressants are, are better than, than placebos. And my own clinical experience uh, would, would, would back that up at all. I did not see a lot of recoveries from patients I, I prescribed antidepressants to. I, yeah. I saw a lot of change from, from the psychotherapy from the psychotherapy techniques. I would also say, though, that this is a problem in psychotherapy as well as in psychopharmacology because I think many of the treatments that are being promoted by the gurus who create them as being some you know, new treatment. We have all these schools of therapy competing yeah. with each other, CBT and ACT and EMDR and, and uh, you know... DBT. Uh, yeah, yeah, DBT and rational emotive, or REBT and, yeah, you yeah. know, all, all of these. I think if you look at, at their effectiveness in the treatment of depression, it's uh, what they say is, oh, well, we're as good as antidepressants, so we're good. But to my way of thinking, that's condemnation through faint praise, because if you say your psychotherapy is only as good as an antidepressant, you're really saying it's only as good as placebo. Yeah. 
And that's really then why I have developed team therapy, which is a data-driven therapy, so therapists can see for the first time at the beginning and end of every single therapy session, what impact did you make in this in the in the therapy? Yeah. And uh, I, I believe that the therapies in the future will be data driven, and we'll find psychotherapy techniques that are you know hundreds of times more powerful than the chemicals called called antidepressants. Yeah. In fact, I believe that these techniques have already been created uh, and, and and already exist because that's what what many of us are seeing using some of the new techniques and, and measuring things at the start and, mm-hmm. start and end of, of sessions. But the, the information is, um, is, is shocking. I think it's something people need to think about. Uh, you, you, you can do your own reading on it and find a lot of research articles and people expressing opinions one way or the other. I would finish by saying it's not only a problem in psychiatry but in all of medicine and surgery because uh, we we had a fellow, uh, uh, trying to think of his name, he was featured on the cover of the Stanford Magazine about three or four years ago. He's a researcher at uh, the Stanford Medical School, and he was pointing out that there's a lot of new drugs uh, and, and coming out for high blood pressure, diabetes, yeah. cancer, and, and, and things like that, that also appear to have very little benefit above and beyond the placebo effect or above and beyond older, you know, cheaper, cheaper medications. And so the solution, I, I think, would be that uh, drug companies, I, I believe, were all corruptible. And, and I'm not sure that I'm not convinced that drug companies can do valid and honest studies of products that they're trying to market. Well, I, I think there, there there's a systemic issue there that even is far farther reach, reaching than this because there's what's called the foul drawer problem. Yeah, exactly. If you if you do a study of anything, you know, it could be how many people die crossing the street, whatever it happens to be, and then you find nothing, you're not going to publish it. Exactly. And sometimes you might even want to publish it, but the journals won't accept it. So, well, you didn't find anything. We're well, yeah. not going to publish your study. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's exactly right. So, so that's what our, our you know, common uh, basis of science is, is doing. Yeah. And, and I've heard that... Uh, Everyone wants to find something to be excited about. Yeah. And so there's tremendous pressure to kind of find something in your findings, even if it's capitalizing on shafts, find something at the 0.05 level of significance yeah. and some connection between two variables, and then, yeah. then you publish it, but it's not real because it can't be validated in an independent uh, replication yeah. study. There, there's a movement afoot in, uh, in science now where uh, certain uh, publications uh, have decided that you can submit your proposal for an article ahead of time before you've even done any study. And then you have to submit, yeah. no matter what you find. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. There's also pressure. There's a movement. Again, I should have done my research before the podcast. Maybe I can put some reference to it on, on the write-up. But there's a new movement to try to force drug companies to make all their databases public. Yeah. And so independent investigators uh, can do proper yeah. uh, analyses. Another uh, solution would be to have an independent governmental agency test all of these drugs and make it illegal for drug companies to test yeah. their own products yeah. because you're just not going to get a, uh, an honest thing. It's, it, there's an inherent conflict between the needs of science and, and the needs of marketing. Yeah. And uh, that, that's kind of the bottom, bottom line of this, uh, of this podcast. So on, on this pessimistic note, <laughs> uh, I hope that there's some good news there. And uh, at least part of this good news is what you're saying about the, the team model, and I don't want to you know, toot our horn too much here, but um, I think that the fact what, that what you're doing is data-driven and on a constant basis, because you know, being one of those practitioners myself, I know that I get a tremendous amount of information from asking my clients how they're doing and how they're progressing in, in their, in, in their uh, therapy. Absolutely, and using quantitative, reliable, valid scales to, to document what, what, what we're doing. And I think measurement-based outcome-informed therapy, measurement-based therapy, data-driven therapy will be the data, the, the, the therapy of the future. Yeah. And I think the big discoveries will come from clinicians like you and many others who are beginning to measure things 
and then can say, oh my gosh, look at I'm getting these fantastic high-speed results with this kind of patient or this kind of diagnosis or this kind of a problem, and, and then we can figure out, well, what, what are you doing that's getting this amazing result? Yeah. And then we, we can learn learn to do, do the same thing. Yeah. So, well, thank you for bringing this up to us. Um, that was, uh, well, I hope this isn't the end of my career or the I, end of I our hope. podcast series <laughs> because a lot of people don't like hearing this. And I know. I'm, I'm it's rather controversial, to, yeah. Reluctant to bring bring the bring it up because I don't want to hurt people's feelings and uh, and if someone's getting a placebo effect then uh, maybe that that's okay if they think their your the drug is working for you if it's all in in, in your mind at least it's it, but it's still real and yeah and it is real that. absolutely yeah. I have a number of of clients who will say to me you know I've been taking this or that and it's been very helpful and I say exactly. great more power to you keep taking it absolutely. All right, well, thank you, David. Thank you, Fabrice. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page, and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists, as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. <laughs>